Hey, welcome to the Extra Podcast. My name is Daniel, and I'm joined around a beautiful table with Greg Harris. Hello. Andy Steiger. Here. And Jeff Bucknam. Hi there. Jeff, you're looking mighty tanned I lately, and you're chipper. Am, you're happier than normal. What's I am the deal? tan. Well, I've had a holiday. I've spent a lot of hours watching a uh, base, baseball team lose, oh. Oh. but I got that out of my system, and I'm back, and better than ever. Just kidding. I, I don't know if I'm better than ever. I always but I'm know back. that Jeff has been at baseball games because he's got the raccoon oh, eyes. Oh, yeah. Dude, he does have the raccoon eyes. Yeah. No, and the that, nose. Nobody the dark can, nose. Oh, the dark nose. Yeah. You know That's the right. brother's been in and the And you know sun. it's been good when he's on stage and you can see it like oh, on buddy. stage. It's a brown <laughs> nose is what it is. So it's pretty unbelievable, man. Mm-hmm. You might want to invest in a hat or sunscreen or something, or some a fake tanning package. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like our listeners to know that it's actually not as bad right now, like the sunglass tan lines. It's That's not because that bad. I, I well, it's been it's been about a week since I've had uh, watching baseball. Why well, oh, it's been okay. smoky too. So yeah, not a lot of, and I have been sitting underneath an umbrella. I'm like, uh, yeah, I, Mary I have this. I'm like one of those uh, golfers who has the umbrella above their heads as they yeah. walk. I I kept an umbrella with me to keep the sun off my face, because I was so concerned about uh, ab- offending your sensibilities with my raccoon face. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You gotta you gotta protect the money maker, baby. The money maker <laughs> is that? Are we talking about my face? Yeah, I don't think it's ever made me a single <laughs> dime. <laughs> what band? What, what a brand of umbrella was that? It's free. I only use free umbrellas. <laughs> he stole the high street umbrella no, and no, he uses that. I one. get I get free umbrellas from uh, a lot of times the golf little the golf tournaments you get mm-hmm. invited to. Sometimes yeah. they give you the free umbrella, so I just stockpile those. So there's several several in the, in the back of my car. And I use them frequently for both sun and rain. Do you play a lot of golf? I don't, Daniel. I don't play a lot of golf. I uh, I used to play a lot of golf, but now I don't play a lot of golf. And I went the last round of golf I had, I got really bored of it after seven holes. Hmm. I used to get bored of it after 14 holes, but now it's seven. So I don't know what's going to happen to the future. Of my life. I'm not good enough anymore. I used to be good, but I'm not good enough anymore to keep my own attention. Do you watch golf on TV? Any I, of you guys? I did a little bit this week. No. Huh. Good for you. Hey, guys. Well, speaking of TV, there was some controversy in the evangelical world lately. The Twitterverse. The Twitterverse. Kevin DeYoung, one of the reformed... He's at RTS, I think. He teaches there. Yeah, he just moved to a church in uh, North Carolina, I think. And he's teaching at the Reformed Theological Seminary campus there. But he's a well-known guy. He, he's written lots of books that we all like, I think. Most of his books are great. Mm-hmm. And he's also a writer for the Gospel Coalition. Yep. And he released a an article on yep. Game of Thrones. Did any of you guys read that article, Jeff? Yes, I did. His argument in the article about Game of Thrones, is, I think the title is basically something to the effect, uh, why are Christians watching the Game of Thrones uh, and thinking that it's all okay? And his argument is basically that there's a good chunk of the Game of Thrones that should be considered softcore pornography. And so you have lots and lots of Christians who are in, who are watching this film without much filter or watching this show without much filter and glorying in it in the same way that everybody else is. And he's trying to make sense of that in light of what the scriptures teach regarding uh, Jesus, for example, uh, you know, uh, gouge out your eye, cut off your hand if it causes you to sin, these sorts of things. Hmm. And he's trying to say, look, I don't want to be a, a legalist. I don't, I, you know, I believe in Christian freedom, but at some point you have to draw some line, don't you? And that was his argument. John Piper jumped in as well. And he made a few comments to that effect saying, we really don't care that much about holiness, especially sexual holiness, if this is like indicative of a lot of Christians. Hmm. And then other people responded, woo, in kind, holy smokes. What were some of the responses? Like, what do you mean? Uh, they responded by saying that they were very angry saying, get out of my life and don't, don't judge me for what amounts to be a Christian freedom. I can watch the game of Thrones. I want, and I don't, you know, free in Christ, that sort of stuff. So we, in our production meeting before this, we were discussing bits about this and how you can liken, well, there's sexual content in this movie, but what about violence? Greg, what do you, 
Yeah, I mean, that was one of the chief criticism people raise is that Christians will pick up on the sexual nature of television shows and say, oh, you can't watch that that movie, that show because there's sexual contact and then readily endorse something like, say, Hacksaw Ridge. So a lot of the the real pacifist loving theologians on the Twitterverse loved the Hacksaw Ridge movie, loved it, and was probably the most gory movie of the year in terms of just the gratuitous violence that was on there. So people are, are making the argument, look, what you're doing is you're drawing a distinction between two different kinds of sinful actions, one one of sexual morality and one of of murder or or violence towards others. So are those people, before we interact with that, are the people who are asking that question, Greg, or making that point, making the argument that neither should be watched? The, or are they no, making the, the argument that's saying, well, since you watch the, the gratuitous violence, you should be okay with the gratuitous sex? Because... That right. seems like a really bad argument. The, the first one seems like a good one, which the, is like the argument. If, I think is that if if you can find a Christian, uh, a redeemable Christian theme through the gratuitous violence, why can we not also attribute that to the gratuitous sex and and say that there's something beautiful in the art or whatever some some theme of of redemption from the obviously sinful nature of what you're watching. So the the argument would go, if we're okay with finding, if we're okay with redeeming the violent movie, why would we not be okay with finding areas to redeem of the overly sexualized television show? So my, my uh, chief um, thought in this, well, I, several, one, one of them is, I don't think, I think we need to be really careful in drawing lines in the sand regarding specific issues. I'm not saying that this case here, but when when it comes to, well, you can buy this kind of car and not that kind of car. You you can own this size house and not that size house. You can ha- watch this kind of movie and not that. Like I really, this we're in the area where there's a danger in legalism and Christian freedom as described by Paul over what's the, what's called the disputable matters. I mean, like there, there is such a thing as Christian freedom and we don't want to take our own sense of um, conscience and apply it to everybody else. So that needs to be said. So that the critique that people are making of Kevin DeYoung and others, I think both Kevin DeYoung and, and I certainly appreciate, yes, that is a danger here. However, it is also a danger that we in the Christian church have gotten to the point where we are what? The proverbial, for proverbial frog in the kettle, where we are just so desensitized to sexual content in our culture that we like what used to be considered soft porn- pornography even 10 years ago is now commonly accepted as something that we can just watch. It's a music video. Right. So, so I, there's a, this is, there's a tension here. My, my, my thing is it seems to me that the intent of the author of the film has some part to play in how redeemable a thing is. So my point here is that I, I think that you can do violence. You can show violence in such a way to not glory in the violence, but to actually denigrate violence. So I seen Hacksaw Ridge and I would say that that's what Mel Gibson's doing in this film. He's actually showing the horrible nature of war, right? And in so doing, he's not glorying in the beauty of the violence. He's actually trying to argue with us, the film goers, saying, look how disgusting this is. We should want to have no part of this. Uh, Quentin Tarantino in some of his films makes the violence look beautiful. I would actually argue, I haven't seen the movie, the John Wick movies, but I've been told by people that it's, it glories in violence. So I think that's different. Hmm. Similarly, I think there's a difference between a, a filmmaker who is glorying in sexual immorality, showing it at length and in all sorts of ways for an, for, for a, um, an audience, right? Cause they want to get more, more eyes cause sex sells. There's a difference between that and say the, the nudity that you'll find in Schindler's list, which is actually a demeaning. It's showing how demeaning it was for the Nazis and how they treated people. And you, you see what I'm saying? Like it's, there's, it's not, it's not a sexual, sexually perverse kind of nudity. Hmm. So yeah, I agree that there should be some sort of nuance here, but I do struggle a little bit with the idea that 
that that Christians would, I don't know, think it's okay to, I don't know, Andy, what do you think? Um, <clears throat> what do I think? Can I throw a question out? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, throw it to Andy. Can I throw a question out there? I want to be a yeah. devil's advocate for a second. So, you devil. People, here, let me make this argument. That, that Game of Thrones is about so much more than just sexuality and gratuitous sex scenes. And to, to undermine the entire, uh, or, or to denigrate the entire artistic work because of one aspect that, that the te- television makers choose to employ to get more views is, is not even dealing with the author's intent of what they're trying to do in the, in the storyline. So look, HBO totally might say, let's throw in all these sex scenes and let's not just like allude to sex happening, but let's actually show it because that'll get more views, but we want to get the storyline out there. So let's, let's employ this method to get the storyline out there. But the point is still the story. And if Christians can't see that, then, then it just shows their inability to engage with, with the arts that everything has to fit their. I'm agreeing that there are beautiful elements to, to filmmaking uh, that, that might be telling a story that is actually anti-God. Like you can evaluate a film or a TV show or a song based upon its like technical merit, right? So I can say, for example, oh, look, look at the way that the camera caught, catches the light in that particular scene, or the way that how artistic, how beautiful the the shot is, right? I actually think you could probably make that argument about some porn. Uh, because we believe as Christians that the human body is a beautiful thing, and so I'm assuming that people could shoot the human body in ways that would be quite, quite beautiful. However, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that you, that, that it, it is something that Christians ought, ought to watch. Um, and I don't think Kevin DeYoung's, maybe I'm defending him a little bit here, but I, I actually think, I don't think that he's saying he's denigrating the beautiful elements of the game of Thrones. He's just asking the question that Do, doesn't this lead us so many of us to sin? Isn't this a really, at the very least, isn't it a really dangerous thing to watch this show, to fall in love with it and get to the point where you're watching sex scenes and like, doesn't it have some sort of effect on Christian holiness? Well, that would be one of my thoughts on this. I, I, you know, lately as my kids are getting older, I'm becoming much more sensitive to what they are watching. I find myself at, with the remote, like in hand, like ready to fast forward, you know, through, through anything when I'm watching a movie that I've never seen before with them. And I mean, this could be like a, you know, a really basic movie. I mean, we were even just, we watched the new, uh, Superman, uh, sorry, Superman, the new Spider-Man movie. And the the word porn comes up and thankfully my kid thought he said popcorn. So, uh, (laughs) He goes, oh, he's watching that's- corn on TV. That's hilarious. I'm like, yeah, that's some funny stuff. Uh, but I mean, those are some weird conversations you got to have with your kid. But the thing, though, that's going through my mind is uh, if I'm that concerned of what's going into their mind, why am I not that concerned with what's coming into my mind? And particularly if they're if I know as a man that I am because they're kids and you're a, you're an adult. Mm-hmm. I'm just, again, I'm just, I'm playing the, right. I'm becoming Greg's devil. <laughs> and I think far too many people, uh, think that they have a greater ability to mm. fight off sin than in fact they do when in fact they're being lulled into it, uh, and they need to be much more on guard. I think about the movie, I've been thinking more and more about the movie, uh, Lord of the Rings. And when Gandalf finds out that that's that ring. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, he, he's across the room and he looks at he doesn't even touch it. He doesn't get near it because he knows how bad it is yeah, for him. Frodo says, take the ring. Come on, take it. You, you'll do way better than I will. Right. And he's like and he's like, no, 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 I'm not I'm not even going to touch that thing. Right. And I, I just think as Christians, we have we've got to understand that we that we serve a holy God and that we have been called to holiness and that we are susceptible to falling prey to unholiness, to ungodliness. And so I, I want to stay as far away as I can from those things, uh, but at the same time realizing that you can, that, that we're in a world full of uh, sexual ads and all these other things. So, I mean, I can't, I can't completely, you know, close myself off from, from that and go and become a hermit or something like that. But it doesn't mean that I got to go and put myself in harm's way, knowing that this is going to be an unnecessary temptation uh, or challenge 
And you mentioned, I mean, kind of being lulled. And I think if people, like, it'd be concerning if you if you brought this to someone and you said, okay, here's all the stuff I see in Game of Thrones. And you're someone's pastor, right? You're just saying to a young adult here, here, I see all this stuff in Game of Thrones and I'm concerned about it. And then they say, yeah, but there's probably, like, you could pro- show all this stuff to them, but they still have a reason, almost a reason behind the reason why they want to keep watching the show. But do you think that the root of it is, because they want to see the nudity? Oh, I don't... I mean, we, we don't know whether what the root of it is. I do have a question. Why is it that we're so... Why is it we're trying so hard to defend hmm. a, a show a show like that? Like, why is it so important? I, I mean, I have my own theories. One of them is I think the Christian church is, is um, kind of addicted to the idea that, that we, we can somehow engage in a culture around us fully and completely with no exceptions be just like everybody else, except we've got some Jesus with us, right? So Jesus becomes kind of like this little necklace that we wear. I mean, we do everything else the culture does, and we engage in all the stuff that the culture engages it. But, but, but we got we got a little Jesus with us. I, I actually struggle a great deal to think that that. I mean, when I read some magazines and some of the ways that people talk about it, they just it's almost like we desperately want the culture to like us and think we're normal. <laughs> When the truth is actually the way that the scriptures describe Christians is we are strangers and aliens. You're not totally supposed to feel at home here. And you're probably supposed to look a little weird. I don't know if you've ever been around somebody who just got off the boat, right? That they, they don't fit in. They don't stand in line the way you stand in line. They just, they they stick out a little bit. And so I, this, this desire that Christians have to try to engage and be a part of the, the, the secular culture at every point, I just, I don't know if it's if it's really healthy, I can understand us wanting to love beauty and all of those sorts of things, but there are ways, Mm. you know, Game of Thrones is not the only beautiful filmmaking in the world, right? Mm. To argue that, well, you don't want to denigrate all this other stuff because of the, the one, the, the few sex scenes, which by the way, from what I understand are quite gratuitous and more than a few. So, so I, I mean, it just seems to me that there are other ways that you can, that you can see that kind of beauty and not have to watch Game of Thrones. I don't, yeah. Is it, it is interesting, though, isn't it, how we often find ourselves wanting to push ourselves as close to the line of what can I do uh, in, instead of keeping so a that's distance. So my, that's my point. Is that, okay, so that you will push yourself as close to the line as you, as you, as you can if you think that the good life mm. is had with you being as involved in the, sec, in the culture as you can. Okay, that the culture actually has all the good stuff and Jesus and the gospel are keeping you away from a lot of the good stuff. I mean, all those commands of God and stuff, they keep you away from the good stuff. So I want to have as much of the good stuff as I can, plus a little Jesus. Or you can view it as being, well, actually, Jesus is the good stuff. And that stuff actually is not what I, what I ultimately want. There are, Jesus defines beauty. He defines truth. He defines all of those sorts of things. So I, I want to honor him. Now, I fully admit that Every Christian I know of struggles on this because all of us are convinced, I think, in our minds that the good stuff is actually what the culture's giving, not what Jesus is giving. That's the fight that we have, right? I think that's the fight between flesh and spirit inside of us. But I think what it means to follow Jesus is to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. In other words, to say, no, not my will, yours, Father. And what you say is good and right is what I actually believe to be the case, and I'm going to walk in that way. And that, that's the upside down kingdom mm-hmm. where you think that freedom is going to be found in going after whatever you want, where Christ is saying, actually, freedom is found in submitting to, to me, is finding yourself in me, learning how, you know, in loving, loving God and learning how to, to love other people, you will actually find freedom there, not the other way around the way that our culture spends it. You'll pursue the thing that you think is good for you. And is best for you. So that's, I think that's part of my point is that if you, th- this whole discussion tends to raise questions about what do you really love? Like, what do you really think is going to be best for you? And who do you think is actually going to provide that best for you? If you, if you believe that Jesus is going to provide what's best for you, then his sexual ethic and the way that he talks about sin and, you know, what, uh, don't even, what is it? Don't even touch the garment stained by the flesh. <laughs> Uh, that kind of ethic is the ethic that Christians ought to be pursuing. If, however, you think, no, the good life is held by the promises that the secular culture has regarding sex and all these other, well, then you're going to chase that. But you have to establish that fact first. 
before you end up following it through with your activities, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we talked pretty extensively about that. I think... Do you, I, I feel like I want to clarify one more. Go ahead. No, I just... What I'm trying to say, I think, is that if you think that... If you say, uh, well, no, I actually... I believe... I, I don't... I actually believe that the good life is held in what the culture is trying to tell me is good, but I'm not going to do it because I'm a Christian. Mm-hmm. Then this is just duty. Mm-hmm. Do, do you understand? Yeah. That's my, that's my point. And that's what I feel like so many Christians are only doing out of duty. And what will end up happening to you is that you'll end up thinking, I don't like God because yeah. he's the one he's who ruins, hey, he ruins all the fun. And oh, uh, I wish I could go to the party and do all the things you guys do, but I'm Christian. And you'll eventually ru- rules and all these other things. Right, you'll eventually aban- abandon Christ because of it. If you are even following him as it is, you're just you're, it's just it's just rule keeping. My point is that following Jesus is actually following him because you know he loves you. He's shown that to you on the cross. He has covenanted with you, and he is seeking your eternal good. And it's the belief in that that drives your actions. So you, you end up not watching it because you, you really do believe that what Jesus says about the world, about your life is better. That's what I was getting at with submitting to him actually leads to freedom. You know, but people, people don't see it that way. They see that as, you know, what Paul talks about is slavery, you know, is, is actually your freedom in Christ. Right. Mm. Greg, any final comments on this? No, sir. No, sir. Well, speaking of Greg, <laughs> we should change gears here because Greg preached a Fire of a sermon this weekend. Whoa. He really did that? Because it was about the Holy Spirit and then the fire. fire. The, and the Holy Spirit coming uh, with fire. Yeah, f- tongues sure. of fire. Tongues of fire. Hey, Greg, tell us what was in that sermon you did. Give us a quick recap. Yeah. And we want to discuss it because I'm sure there is lots more that you wanted to say. So this was kind of part two of a sermon on uh, the Holy Spirit. The first one was the week before where I talked about... Uh, why it's for our advantage that the Holy Spirit came and uh, where that sermon landed was that it's good that the Spirit came because he filled the apostles and the, he inspired the apostolic teaching, uh, giving us uh, the language in John is he, he guided the apostles into all truth and he taught them all things and he uh, brought to their mind everything that Jesus taught. So talking about the sufficiency of Scripture in that we don't need anything outside of the apostolic teaching, which we have in the New Testament, which we have in the Scriptures. We don't need anything outside of the inspired teaching uh, for being able to believe perfectly about God and being able to obey Him perfectly. And then I said, the other part that was so great about the Spirit coming is that we have uh, the Holy Spirit living within us now, those those who have repented of sin and believe the gospel, we don't just have Jesus standing beside us, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And so this past weekend sermon was about what does it look like to be filled with the Spirit then? If the, if the Spirit is within us, what does the Scripture say about the kinds of things the Spirit does within us? Mm-hmm. So I talked about the multiplicity of gifts, uh, how the Spirit will gift us in different ways for the building up of the body, and how the Spirit will produce the same fruit in all of us and uh, talked about the Galatians 5 list, talked about um, Ephesians 5 and the Spirit putting songs in our lips. And so the Spirit does different things for everybody in terms of our gift set and the ways in which he wants to use us for the building up of others. But he also wants to do the same work in all of us in our characteristics and the kinds of things we do when we're gathered together. So what was... So can I summarize what you said? From what, I wasn't here for the two weeks, but it seems to me that the first week you talked about how the spirit works through his word. Yep. And the second week you talked about how the spirit works in other ways too. Yep. Uh, maybe that's overly simplistic. No. Or works through people. Love well, it. yeah. I mean, the spirit does other things like empowering us and uh, giving us gifts and his fruit is in us. Mm-hmm. So our act, mm-hmm. our, our actions in obedience to God are actually spirit driven. Right. right actions, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and the goal of the Christian life actually is to agree with the Holy Spirit and walking in his way and mm-hmm. keep right? in step keep, with the keeping spirit. in step with the spirit, which is the language of Paul. But you got like a couple of different, like your experience after the first week yeah. <laughs> and your experience after the second week were very different in terms of emails and responses that you got. The yeah. Fir- yeah. It, it was, um, so here's what I thought going into this these two sermons. Um, 
I, I expected a a multiplicity of responses from people on both sermons. I thought that there would be both, you know, um, really overwhelming support and also some real significant questions about both because I think Northview is an eclectic group of people. We have people who come here and call Northview home and they come from all kinds of different backgrounds from Reformed Church to some Baptist to, to some charismatic to some uh, traditional Pentecostal to obviously Mennonite brethren. And so that group of people are going to have very different views on on things like the spiritual gifts. Um, what I what I found interesting was after the first sermon, um, hearing by, in, in terms of kind of engaged feedback from people who, who provided arguments or that kind of stuff, was mostly like, uh, we don't actually think the scriptures are as sufficient as, as you presented it to be. There seems to be more room for things like the, the work of the spirit. When you say the work of the spirit, you mean? Outside of the scriptures. Okay. To which my, my response back to these people via email and conversation was, I'm not saying the spirit can't or doesn't move outside of the scriptures. I'm just saying that's the sufficient way in which he does. By sufficient, by, by sufficient, you mean that if he were not to choose, not to move outside of it, you would not actually be not actually be missing something. Right. And this is you where you have a full Christian life and never hearing an extra biblical word from the Lord. Right. And I think because you have all you need in what the Bible teaches. Which, by the way, just I'm, I just want to emphasize this on the 500th anniversary <laughs> this year of the of the uh, Protestant Reformation. Right. That like that's. What sola scriptura? Right. Ultimately, not just not just the sp- that that we don't need a pope, we don't need the tradition of the church. We don't need. We need God. God is fully spoken, yep. in His Word that has been g- given to us. And, and five hundred years ago, the more clear word was th- the word of the pope. And five hundred years later, the more clear word is is the pope of our feelings and experience. Mm-hmm. I think where people would push back though is they would say. Well, but Jesus said that he needs to go so that he could send the Spirit. So why would he do that if we don't need the Spirit? No, he's not saying that. I don't think you're saying that you, you don't need the Spirit. You're saying that what the Spirit has given the church hmm. is the inspired text of Scripture. Right. When Jesus, So Jesus in John 16 saying that I will lead you and you being the apostles into all truth. Right. So what they wrote down, it was commissioned by Jesus through the power of the Spirit for the good of the church. And the way in which so, we are guided into all truth is through our engagement with the apostolic teaching. Right. So the point here being, we're talking about God's revealed knowledge, his revelation. Right. We, right. Have, we have a mediated relationship with God chosen by that. I mean, like there's a, mm-hmm. there's a, there's a mediator, Jesus, between God and men. But Jesus chose to speak to the church after him through the apostles' teaching, primarily, which Guided of course you're, the you're, Holy Spirit. You're, you're, well, the Holy Spirit was the one who inspired all that. That was the, right. he he was the means by which all this took place. And so the Holy Spirit comes and he fills the apostles, and they mm-hmm. are carried along, as it says in Second mm-hmm. Peter. Mm-hmm. They are carried along by the Holy Spirit, and they write these things down, these prophecies down, the words of Jesus down. And so what that means is when you're reading the scriptures, you're reading the Spirit's work. It's why Paul can say hmm. that all scripture is God breathed, is yep. is theopneustos. Yep. It's it's the breath, the very breath of God, which the Old Testament is the Spirit himself. So my yep. point there so it seems to me that there there should not be a division then between what the scriptures are teaching and what the spirit is teaching. Right. So don't say, well, you know, because people will make comments and I've heard them say comments before. And Greg, you mentioned one earlier to me that people will say, oh, you believe in, in God, the father, God, the son and God, the Holy Scripture. <laughs> no, I believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who is spoken through mm. the scripture. In fact, I, the reason that you know that there is a God, the father and God, the son mm. and God, the Holy Spirit is because you see it revealed in scripture. OK, you don't know that apart from scripture. That's right. a special revelation of God that's been given in his scripture. So to, to separate the scriptures from God, they're not God, but they are the word of God. Hmm. To separate them out and try to say, well, no, there's the Holy Spirit and then there's the scriptures. Yes, but the Holy Spirit primarily uses the scriptures and has done so sufficiently, meaning that you have all you need for life and godliness in the revealed teaching of hmm. God through the scriptures, right? The hmm. apostles' teaching. See, that, that, that is, I'm, I keep pressing that that is a uh, historic 
Christian Orthodox belief in the you, sufficiency of scripture. It's a Protestant unique belief that we all stand on the shoulders of the great reformers agreeing with, whether you're, uh, you know, a, a, a radical refor- reformer or, or another, you, we all stand on their shoulders, but you got pushed back on this. But do you think they misunderstood you or do you think they were actually pushing back on this idea that there was still more knowledge I think the primary issue with uh, the primary feedback I got from people, I I think the motivating factor for them engaging with that first sermon the way they did was, was this belief that we are trying to limit the ways in which the Holy Spirit will move in our midst today. Uh, Yep. The argument of sufficiency of scripture is that the Holy Spirit has chosen to communicate that God, the triune God has chosen to communicate to his church primarily through this means. Right. It's not to say that he can't do it another way and hasn't done it another way. There are all sorts of examples of extra biblical. We believe, I mean, that's why I think your second sermon was basically about, pro- we believe in prophecy. Yeah. But primarily, the bread and butter of the Christian life yeah. is the spirit-inspired word. It's why in the early church they gathered around the apostles' teaching. Mm. When, they, when they gathered, they saw in it Jesus talking. Yeah, and what what I found in my conversations about that first sermon, at least um, when I had conversations with people face to face, my my question back for those who are pushing back against that was: Are would would they be comfortable saying that if they didn't have the gift of say prophecy, that they would therefore not have enough to actually know about God? Like, does everyone need to have the same gift set in order to be able to, to know who God is and know that he wants us to follow him? And everyone answers that question. No. So everyone said, well, no, no, no. Like not everyone has the same gifts. And I said, exactly. That's the point. But, but the Holy Testament, the Holy Spirit's testimony through the apostles is that everyone needs the scriptures. Right. Not everyone needs to have every single gift. That's why there's a body with different parts and everyone brings their own but pe- but people will bristle against the idea that and, and I mean I you have to understand, I really appreciate why they bristle hmm. that they bristle against the idea that your your Christian life is going to be okay, is going to be fine if you never hear an extra biblical word from the Lord hmm. they will bristle at that because many people have experienced an extra biblical word from the mm-hmm. Lord and it has been a source in many of their lives at, of significant um, a renewal yep. and joy in fact they look back with tears at the moment where they 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 felt God communing with them, speaking mm. to them, giving them some word it, prof- prophetically or mm. you know in their spirit, leading them into whatever. That's I, I, I don't hear you saying. And I, I kind of want to clarify. Like I, I, Northview, you I I don't in any way. Well, you can speak for yourself. I don't in any way believe that's that's bad. I think it's good. Right. Spirit does do that. Right. That's that's great. Yeah. But. Yes. I, but sure. yep. If the Spirit doesn't do that, chooses sovereignly not to do that, Holy Spirit, he chooses sovereignly not to do that for another Christian. That other Christian is in no worse situation because he or she has the full revelation of God in a book. Yeah, and my basically one of the things that I, I based the argument on this past weekend was that all of these extra biblical ways in which we hear from God are, are described, I think, in in the scriptures in 1 Corinthians in particular as as a revelation, not, not of the same authority as the apostolic teaching, as God revealing himself through the spirit, through the scriptures. But but I think that's the, the language Paul uses that every every prophetic word that someone has is on the basis of something being revealed to them. Mm. And, and my point was that not everyone is going to receive these revelations that if you receive a revelation, the, the spontaneous words, usually pretty specific for you or someone else. If you receive those, that doesn't mean you're a more locked in engaged spiritual Christian than the person who doesn't hear those things. I think, I think that's why um, we need the body is because we all have something that we bring to the table to, as Paul says, and, uh, first Corinthians 14 to strengthen, to encourage and to comfort. And yet that text is really helpful. First Corinthians 14, because what it's arguing is that it is that compared to tongues, which is a particular 
showy gift for the Corinthian church. Mm-hmm. Um, compared to tongues, which is not understandable by those who hear it, and only understandable, it's a, it seems to be utilized mm-hmm. in prayer to God. It's only for the individual unless it's interpreted. Then, then it can become beneficial for the community. That prophecy is better than that. Mm-hmm. It's better in the sense that it's more edifying for the church. Not better in the sense that it's a better gift. It just has more pop right. for the right. community of faith and right. therefore should be given privilege in the, in the gathered assembly. So, so yes, everyone's going to, not everyone's going to be prophe- prophesy. Mm-hmm. Not everybody's going to have prophecy and hear from the Lord in that way, which is, which is by the way, a point that probably should be emphasized because we have teachers running around these days saying, oh, you can hear, you can hear, you can hear extra biblically from God. You just, he's always broadcasting and you need to know that's not what the scriptures teach. There are some people gifted in prophecy who will experience that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. They are a blessing to the church because what they speak is for the edification of others. Yep. And they should be given opportunity to make those, give those statements. And there's methods that we do that even in our church, right? Mm-hmm. We don't do it in a public gathering immediately, but you can give a prophecy to our elders and they will end up discerning it and then passing along, which is, by the way, very in line with what the scriptures teach. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean everyone's going to do it. There's going to be some people who have tongues. There's going to be some people who prophesy and some people who do these other, these other activities. But everyone has a gift. That's mm-hmm. part of... Mm-hmm. being a, a, a faithful, mature Christian yeah. just doesn't mean your gift's going to be in prophecy. And the spirit is not just doing prophecy. Yeah. The sp- spirit's also doing administration, the spirit's, you know, right? yeah. teaching. Do you, think, do you think though, just on that prophecy note, uh, and you brought that up in your, your sermon, mm-hmm. Greg, uh, we have a very unique way. It seems to me in the West of how we understand prophecy that might not be completely in line with how Paul would have understood prophecy. Do you think Paul would have only understood prophecy as uh, the the seeing into the future? No, I don't think that's even what Paul is saying in here in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, that, that the prophetic word, something is only prophetic because it is the, the speaking out of a received revelation. Mm. So that's what makes something a prophetic word is that you are saying what you have received. It could be a word for the future. It could be. Mm-hmm. And yet in, in this case, in, in First Corinthians, it, the language is centered around kind of an encouragement, a strengthening, mm. a comforting. So it's a it's an encouraging of someone in a way that they've already been walking or a way they should or that kind of a idea. This, I've heard it uh, said it can be future telling or forth telling. Sure. Yep. Right. And it, it's like it's just it's interesting to me that that's one aspect that you often don't uh, you know, hear a lot. Here's another th- uh, question that I wanted to throw out there to see what you guys thought is in the in the church in Corinth, I think it is interesting that they were dealing with specific issues that Paul's addressing, and so he brings up specific spiritual gifts that he then brings up different ones in other yeah. other books. Yeah, and in Corinth, it was a lot more of the miraculous, and then in, in Romans, there's a lot more of the... <laughs> so standard. Romans is just standard like, kind of, we love Romans, right, in the West, because we're like, okay, now this is what we're used to. And yet, even in Romans and in, and in Thessalonians, you have... Paul bringing up prophecy. Yeah. Um, and so my, my take on all that, I didn't bring this up in the sermon, but, but my take on how to understand the way that I think this works is that I, I actually think that the gift, if we want to define it as the gift, it is in the receiving of revelation. I think it's the receiving of revelation that is for not everyone. And so that might work itself out in a prophetic word, or maybe that re- the, that word that you've received. What do you mean is, by revelation? What I mean is a, a thought that you weren't you weren't looking at the scriptures and the Spirit illuminated it or made it clear to you. It, it's you're doing something in the midst of your day, and and God interrupts you with a thought that is spontaneous, that is out of nowhere, and that is, I think, more specific than not. Wayne Grudem's is he's, he's a good. I think is a good definition. God bringing something spontaneously to mind. The reason that he uses that is because it's a bit of a catch-all. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the arguments that he makes, and I think is important here, is that. Uh, just because you're not gifted in prophecy doesn't mean that you might not get a revelation. Do you understand what I mean? Mm-hmm. Similarly, uh, just because you might not be gifted in teaching, but you might teach on occasion. Do you see what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's just that people who are gifted in teaching have a unique, uh, special kind of ability in that in that area. Same thing in administration. I think a lot of people can administrate, right? But some people, it's mm-hmm. they're really good at it, mm-hmm. and it, they have more of a 
it's it's more they're they're they, they're specially wired to do it. Uh, similarly, prophecy it is possible for somebody to get a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom, whatever, who's not but, necessarily gifted mm-hmm. as a prophet. Mm-hmm. That, but that's what I want to. That's what I'm trying to. Uh, bring up here is, is is that might be where um, a point of te- of tension or a point of confusion is how is that knowledge that's being brought to you different from the revealed word of god well and is it different because wouldn't mm-hmm. we say that prophecy would actually because the canon you mentioned your sermon the canon is closed yep so with the prophecy that a faithful christian receives it would act if it let's say it 100 percent is prophecy it would point back to the scripture and affirm something in the scriptures correct like it's not going to be some sort of new right. Yeah, it's not going to contra- it's not going to contradict. If it's a moral, already. if it's a moral thing, no, that's right. You're going to be able to find that in in the Bible. Um, h- however, I I mean, prophecy can, is extra biblical in the sense that it comes, but it doesn't have the authority right. that the scriptures that the, the scriptures in the, in the sense have. that the person could be wrong. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And this is, I mean, there's a debate on this. Okay, I remember the first, but, but the Old Testament. I mean, I, I agree with Gwen Groom's delineation here. I believe that the Old Testament prophet mm-hmm. is akin or equal to the New Testament apostle. So when you read in the Old Testament about the prophecies and these guys got prophecies and they respond to the prophecies, when you read that as a New Testament Christian and you want to make that into something that's applicable to your day, you should be reading Bible there. Mm-hmm. Okay, because that's how those the prophets, and I'm mm-hmm. putting air quotes there, there, but like that's how those uh, specially ordained prophets in the New Testament they're called apostles, and God worked specially through them to communicate to His church. There is another thing though in New Testament prophecy, and it doesn't seem to have the same kind of authority. But you have people now who are claiming to be apostles. Have they ceased, Greg? I think the unique apostolic role of of the 12, of what Jesus was referring to when he said that you're going to be guided into all truth by the Spirit, I think that that, that office no longer exists. It's been fulfilled through the apostles who were sent out to be the foundation of the early church, and we have their testimony in the scriptures. Where so would, I, I think someone who's, who calls themselves an apostle, and by that they mean they, they hold some sort of authority, I don't think they have scriptural support to do so. Which, by the way, the scripture says to be an apostle, you actually need to walk with Jesus. Yeah. And this is why Paul was in contention. And, well, and why Paul, seen the argument Christ. that he Paul made. argued strongly that actually he was visited by Jesus on the that's Damascus right. road. And that's and why so he that, makes that argument. That was, but see, that's what some of the apostles these days, some of the people who call themselves, and this is a good, we should probably distinguish between big A apostle and little A apostle. Big A apostle is what we're talking about here, right? Has any authority over the church and these mm-hmm. sorts of little A apostle. The word means sent one. So, or messenger. And so... So there are those who might be gifted in a, in apostle sort of ways, meaning that they're kind of pioneering church planting types. We're not talking about that little a apostle. The people who are calling themselves apostles these days mean it with a big A, mm-hmm. that we have authority over the church and they are gifted by God in further revelation to the mm-hmm. church. And so they end up bringing these things and everyone, if we're to disobey them, is basically to disobey God who's speaking through them. What Greg's saying is that he doesn't think that's around. I don't think that's around. The church, by the way, for centuries has said that's not around. In fact, there is one church that I know of, there are others, but there's one significant church that believes that there is a living apostle today. And it is? The Catholic Church. Right. And the living apostle is? The Pope. The Pope. Right, but what these guys are doing is saying, no, 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 the Pope's not one of them, but, but I am because I, I don't yep. know, I'm a pastor of a big church mm-hmm. or something to that effect, and I saw Jesus in a dream. That's essentially their, their argument. Well, to conclude that thought then, where would you find that in the scriptures that the apostles have ceased? Like, is that a tradition thing, or can you find that in the text? I think the language of the apostles being uh, the foundation of what uh, the church was um, so built f- on Ephesians four, I think Ephesians two twenty, I think Ephesians two twenty. Mm-hmm. Church is built on the foundations of the apostles and, and the prophets. Also, the history of the church has argued such. Although the modern apo- modern apostles argue that the problem with the church and the reason we haven't taken over the world is because we haven't embraced their authority. Mm-hmm. So this is a whole discussion about the new apostolic reformation and a whole. There, there's a whole set of teachings, and this is it's become a very. Uh, 
famous uh, thing. Actually, we probably will put a link on this podcast to an article written in Christianity Today recently regarding some of these folks who make these arguments. Mm-hmm. And you can read about it and, uh, and note it. Yeah, it's another can of worms. We can honestly spend hours talking about that. But we don't have that kind of time, friends. Andy's a busy guy. Andy's a busy guy, and we are we are a radio show that likes to stay on time. We're a podcast, Andy. Yeah. Sure, Andy. And uh, we like to make sure we keep this short and brief. So um, make sure you tune in next time. If you have questions, please email them to extra at northfield.org. And we look forward to uh, hearing from you guys. Emails. This has been... The Extra Podcast. Have a good week.